here now with Mike Keeley, the professor of communication arts here at Allegheny College. And Mike, thanks for coming. Yeah, on. thanks. I'm now tell us, tell us your input and how you got your students involved in this short but really awesome film about Daryl Lynn Jones. Well, uh, Gene Shenley called me last year because I had done a film a few years ago on the Conneaut Lake Historical right. Society, yes. and she was part of that. And she called me and said she had just seen a movie called The Rookie, mm -hmm. uh, and she liked it. And then she was thinking, well, we have a story just like that here with the Jones brothers, and wouldn't it be cool to make a film about them, and would we be interested? And I said, yeah, that sounds like a, a good idea. So I got a I uh, gathered up a group of students and asked them if they'd be interested in working on a film on the Jones Brothers. Uh, the students were uh, Cassandra Kariakis, Brittany Adams, and Lily Loreno. And uh, the one interesting thing, they were all, and they're, they've all done great films here and stuff, uh, and uh, Brittany just graduated, and Cassandra and Lily graduated last year, so they worked on the film up till then, and even past that, actually, after they graduated. Uh, none of them knew anything about baseball. <laughs> so that was interesting. So they learned a lot about baseball, but they knew as filmmakers that there was a good story here. And so that's what we found. You know, and that's pretty interesting. You said they didn't know anything about baseball because they looked at it from a different perspective of right. someone that would know all about baseball. Right, right. And they saw the story and the themes of community and family and brothers and making it to the, you know, to the pinnacle of your profession and the, and the hard work that went into that. So they understood all that. And then I could explain to them what an inning was and stuff like <laughs> that. So, <laughs> What did your students and yourself get out of this film? Because it has some messages in there. Well, I mean, one of the things that, like being in this field that I really love, is when students come here doing these types of films, uh, and we, you know, we do a lot of different topics but it gets them out into the community it gets them off campus so they mm -hmm. learn a lot about being in this area that they wouldn't if they weren't doing stuff like this so that's that's one thing that they get out of it um, and then I mean just the practice of doing it is, is a good experience for them and and so uh, exploring and practicing the art of film and connecting to the community is is all Plus, is, uh, we just had a screening of the film on campus uh, a few weeks ago, and Brittany was there for that, and she just, you know, she met a lot of people in the community that she wouldn't have met before, and so that's just a part of their experience here that broadens it. What about existence. this film itself? What will people get when they watch this film? What messages did even the young students learn from the Jones brothers and what they went through and how they got to be where they are? Well, perseverance um, and being humble um, and how important family is. All that stuff came through. The other thing that came through just from the people we talked to uh, and the articles we read and stuff was how much their success meant to the people here and how proud people are, are of what they did um, and, that, and, and, and that they give back to, to the community in a lot of ways, you know, now through coaching and stuff, but lots of other ways too. But I think that's what they, that's what they really got out of it. So, Do you think also people, when they watch this film, can also stop for a minute think about the history of our own country in this area in Crawford County and realize that two young African-American uh, gentlemen from predominantly a white area rose to status, have they rose in this area, and how people respect and really admire them. Yeah, I mean, we that's one of the issues we thought would be central to the film was race and racism, but it wasn't. Uh, there, when we talked to them about it, there, I think their family was so respected, and they, you know, the the people that they were. They, it sounds like it wasn't really an issue for them growing up here. Daryl talks about experiencing it when he goes to the minor leagues to play in Virginia. Right. So much so that he was thinking of, do I really want to do this? And his mom mm -hmm. convinced him to keep playing. So, so I think that says a lot about the area. Uh, and they literally were, you know, 
them and their brothers, I think, for the most part, were the only African Americans in their school. Yeah. Um, and I expected to hear stories of like, oh, this is what happened, and they didn't have any stories like that here, which was kind of nice to hear. You know, I didn't expect that really. So. And I think another thing they're going to take out of this film too, Mike, and your opinion definitely one is the foundation they had from their parents oh yeah and that comes through from both their mom and their dad um and they you know they they talked about how their dad coached them and and pushed them and wanted them to be the best they could be but he did it in a if they didn't want to be baseball players that would have been fine with him too but just the support and the work ethic and uh you know it was fun to see the different personalities between daryl and lynn (laughs) you know daryl was a year older and uh uh, driven like that he wanted to be in the major leagues and Lynn kind of came behind and yeah. Lynn worked really hard too but I think his attitude was a little different and he talks about that in the film too so and you know it's really cool as you talk about giving back is to me it's really impressive oh Daryl is part of the baseball staff here at Allegheny right and Lynn is part of the baseball staff at Teal right which on I a think, volunteer basis on yeah. a volunteer basis both yeah. of them giving back and also helping to develop young men into even you know more mature men as they deal with them at the college level right right and that's that we went to the game where they were coaching against each other (laughs) which was fun to see and uh yeah there's you know we we talked to john atkins who was their athletic director and coach at uh when they were in high school and uh he told a story about the first time uh he saw daryl at bat on tv and yeah. he kind of gets choked up when yeah. he's talking about it because it just meant so much to him. And then he also tells the story of how Lynn let him keep the World Series trophy for a winter while he was away. So, so th- that's 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 who they are. Uh, that's the kind of people they are too. And it's not in the film, but you know just how successful they were in high school. <laughs> Daryl was like nineteen and zero as a pitcher. <laughs> Lynn struck out once in four years, mm-hmm. and it was his last at bat. And so just, you know, they were good, but they, when you talk to them, they also say we were a good team. We had, you know, they weren't saying, they don't say we were the stars of the team. They say there were a lot of good players on their team. And, and, you know, it's really interesting as you talk to people in this area that know them and they always deflect that attention from yeah. themselves yeah. and get it to their teammates, as your film pointed out. And, and we're very blessed, too, that you, you took the undertaking along with your three students to make this film. So we're blessed because this is something this community will have forever. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and uh, you know, we want to thank you and the, and the students at Allegheny College. and. You know, we're really lucky, too, because in this area, we have such a great relationship with Allegheny College. Allegheny College seems to always be there for us, whatever avenue we need their help in. That's good to hear. So, so I want to thank you, Mike. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming on yeah. and continue to find work you do. Thank you. As a family, we fished a lot. We would all come a lot of times to Pymatumi and uh, fish over over on the rocks. My older brother told us that Daryl used to feed the dog eggs all the time and he killed the dog. Really? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I don't remember that. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't Judy tell told me that. Judy told us told me that story. Yeah. Huh? He never told me that because I guess he didn't want to traumatize me. <laughs> Fine. And that's the Jones Homestead. Always had a meal and always had a roof over our heads, you know, so we had a lot of fun in that house.
get away too soon No, 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 no I think um, when you talk about how we got started, it would probably all start with my family. My father was not a baseball player. He was actually a football player and actually played semi-pro with the, it's called the Meadville Zippers. But he was very influential in, in our baseball careers because he was one of the ones that started Suburban Little League. My older brothers were uh, nine and 10 years older than us. so. We kind of had a couple of role models uh, ahead of us that we could uh, be mentored as far as sports is concerned. And, uh, but our father was always a, a, our coach and he was a real good coach. He never pressed us, uh, never put pressure on us and uh, taught us to have fun. If I went outside and I said, Dad, I want you to hit me ground balls, he would hit me until I had little welts on my chest because he just, not that he was punishing us or anything, but that's what I chose to do. He wanted to make sure that we were at the best at everything that we could do. We actually had uh, enough kids on our half of the town to put sports teams together. And we played wiffle ball, baseball, uh, all summer long. We had an apple tree uh, about where this old garage is now, and. Uh, you know, we used to, the apples would, would become ripe, they would fall down, and so what we would do with all the extra apples, we would throw at that telephone pole, and we would always have contests to see who could hit the telephone pole. My brother said Sandlot, the, the movie Sandlot, that was this neighborhood right here. The biggest thing for me was not to keep up with the kids in my class, was to keep up with my brother who really strived to be better, uh, a, a real good athlete. He made it easier for me, because by keeping up with him, him being one of the better athletes in, in uh, his class, in his school, uh, I just kept up with him and kind of rode the wave with him. Through high school, uh, we played together, which was really nice uh, to be able to have your brother play with you. I was the, uh, uh, actually the athletic director and also the high school coach for both Daryl and Lynn Jones. Uh, back in the period I started teaching uh, and coaching my very first year in 1966. And uh, so then I had them from 1966 through 1970, which was uh, Daryl's last three years. And Lynn, I had him all four years. Those were all great years. We won the championship all four years. So that was a good way to start off my baseball coaching career. They were very well known, very popular, always great students. There was never any issues with eligibility of, of th anything of that nature. Daryl was uh, uh, the type of person that when he went after something, uh, he, he went with all his heart. Me, I was a little bit different. Uh, I was happy-go-lucky. I kind of just hung out with him. Uh, as we got a little bit older, I was the one who partied more. I always had a dream of playing in the big leagues. I know to some people that sounded far-fetched, but ever since I, when I was in high school, I had this dream. It wasn't that I was going out and telling people I was going to play in the big leagues, but it deep in my mind, I always had an idea that I was going to be a major league baseball player. Once we went away to college, Daryl took it to the next level. He was so serious about it. That's all he wanted to do was play, uh, play baseball. Where Daryl went to Westminster, uh, I went to Teal College to, pe uh, to play basketball. Basketball was always my number one love. 1971 went to Madison, Virginia to play in the Shenandoah Valley League. I knew that there was always racism that existed, but I never saw outright, and that isn't that far south. You know, but it, uh, I never had witnessed that before. Now I remember calling home and talking to my mom and, and said, you know, I don't know if I want to be here. And she says, well, you know, what are you there for? And it was always that, well, I was there because it was going to be a stepping stone for me uh, in my career. After my junior year, I had talked to Daryl and I didn't want to, I didn't want to work. <laughs> 
Uh, so I checked with him to see through his contacts if I could go down and play summer baseball. And I did. I, I had an opportunity to go down there and play. Daryl at that time had gone from the Yankees uh, to their half season leg to Fort Lauderdale. And he was at that time in that leg at West Haven. And so I, for a brief period, got a chance to play against him. The one time I remember is my dad did not like flying. He never flew in his life. <laughs> and so, but he liked baseball so much, you know, and he wanted to see us play his first trip on a, um, on a, on a commercial airlines was to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And it went pretty good. And, uh, but he just, he would rather be in a car than be in an airplane. Seven and a half years in the minor leagues is a long time. I was 27 when I finally went to the big leagues. My father was visiting me, watching me play. And I got a call that morning from George Sisler, who was the general manager of the Columbus Clippers. And he says, Daryl, he says, pack your bags. You're going to New York tonight. I turned to my dad and I says, Dad, I just got called to the big leagues. So up on the, that's the lineup card. Um, you know, up on the wall there that they give me as a commemorative. Uh, the, and I'm pretty proud of the fact that, you know, Mickey Rivers, Willie Randolph, uh, Chris Chambliss, uh, I was actually there because Reggie Jackson uh, had a, uh, an Achilles problem and that's when I had got called up to fill it in the lineup. No, I was no Reggie Jackson, um, but I could hold my own and I could hit in the big leagues. First at bat, I hit a uh, fly ball to right field, so I was out. And um, my second at bat in the big leagues, I was facing Jerry Kuzman, who was along, played with the Mets. And at that time, he was with the Minnesota, Minnesota Twins. And he threw me a breaking pitch that kind of hung, and I hit a, got a double down the left field line, my second at bat. And it was really kind of funny. I slid into second base. I, the people that were there, I got a standing ovation and they put up on the scoreboard, this is Daryl Jones' first at bat. And I kind of had a flashback back to those Sandlot days of, you know, the, the playing ball in, in Harmonsburg, playing at Linesville High School, playing at Westminster College, all of the things that you've gone through. And it just was a quick flashback, and, and all of a sudden it was like, all right, I belong. And I happened to walk in on Saturday afternoon, and the game of the week was the New York Yankees. And coming up to plate was Daryl Jones. And, <laughs> and that was really a special, because I was, I was shocked, you know. And, uh, you know, I saw him standing there, and I saw him whipping that bat like he always did. He always had the quick swing from the backside and, and uh, up, up to plate. And I thought, well, you know, he finally made the full circle. talked to me in spring training one year and and I had gone you know we all have gone many players have gone through the same thing but you called me and you said if I if I'm gonna go back to double A this year you said I'm thinking about just packing it in yeah and uh, because you said you weren't gonna spend another year in double A and then that was the that was the year you got your break and went to triple A with uh, with Indianapolis I didn't think I was ever going to get out of double A because it was very difficult for me, but I had enough success that they allowed me to get out of there. I ended up going to triple A and I had made a decision for myself that this was going to be my last year of professional baseball. Uh, I was going to make the most of it. I just wanted to have fun. This was going to be my major leagues. I ended up having the best year I ever had in my life. And I was put on a major league roster. It was the first time I had gone to spring training uh, with a big league club. And the first day I went there, 
Les Moss, who was the manager, told me, don't worry about a thing, you're gonna be my fourth outfielder. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I spent the next five years uh, in uh, the major leagues with the Detroit Tigers. Uh, I had a very good rookie year. I was Tiger Rookie of the Year. Got it in my mind somehow that I, I wanted to see one of our local guys make good play out there in the, in the, uh, the big leagues. Uh, so I decided to not let the lack of a vehicle hold me back and I hitchhiked out to Detroit uh, to see Lynn. That would have been uh, probably his second year with the Tigers. Got out there in time for the game. The weather wasn't looking very good. And sure enough, before game time, uh, the skies opened up and it just poured and the game got postponed. I had signed in 1984 with the, the Kansas City Royals as a free agent. Outfielder, Linda Jones. The following year, we just happened to roll along and get hot at the right time with the Royals, and the next thing you know, we're World Series champs. Remarkable job by this Kansas City club coming back to win three in a row. They call up and, and said, "Hey, you're you're in the you're in the New York Times." I met President Reagan. This was at uh, 1985 when we won the World Series. That can of beer right there, I have one of those in the, in the room in there. Can of beer, still unopened. <laughs> we all look a lot younger in this picture. This was uh, Lynn when he won the World Series against uh, the Kansas City Royals. He asked me if I would hold his World Series trophy while he was gone for the, uh, the winter months. So I was very proud that he allowed me to, to uh, have that, and that's certainly a special memory I have about Lynn allowing me to do that. I had had some prior injuries with a knee where I had to actually have, you know, fluid, you know, drained off of my knee and things like that. But I did have, I ran into a wall catching a baseball, and it aggravated. I just always had pain with it, and I tried to work and to work and to work, and I don't think I was ever released from the Yankees in probably until two years later when I just told them, I says, I says, I'm not going to make it back. And so, yeah, it was, it was tough. It was tough for me. Um, I adjusted after that, and as you, know, as you look back and you'll say, hey, uh, look at the percentage of players that ever play in the big leagues. And... Who did I play for? You know, I could have played for so many at bats with the Cleveland Indians, but I played for the greatest organization that there is in baseball, the New York Yankees. You know, and to this day, you know, I know I have a baseball in the Yankee Museum that has my name on it and as one of the players that competed for the New York Yankees. So something that I'm proud of. And I got there because it was the help of a lot of people. Am I proud to be a Yankee? Absolutely. On a Sunday afternoon. State Farm Insurance there, I'm speaking to help you. Couldn't get away too soon. I'm trying.
trying to sell my antique baseball cards, you know, anybody? I got 50s and 60s before this boy was born. <laughs> I just think I'm very lucky, uh, very fortunate to be in, you know, a little, little guy from Harmonsburg, Pennsylvania, uh, being able to, you know, reach the pinnacle of baseball and, and uh, very lucky, very lucky. We can be anyone we like to be. All those happy people we could meet just through there. On a Sunday afternoon. But the good thing was, was Alexis and Lisa, Alexis, my middle daughter, they were able to be with me. Uh, when we won the World Series in Boston. So it was a good experience for me, but it was even a better experience for them. What I do now is I give back to Teal, just like Daryl gives back to Allegheny. With us coaching now in the college level, I think that's one of the things that young kids, they're always, everything's always the end result. Was it a hit? Um, and that's really not always the things that, that you should be worried about. I could uh, be fishing, which I love to fish. I can be on Pimatumin Reservoir uh, or Shenango Reservoir in just a matter of minutes. They're just genuine people, and that's, you know, that's one of the things that you know, we grew up with, and, and I think maybe one of the things that gravitated me back here and to stay here. It's, it's been good, it's been good. I like small town. I like to be, I like not being around traffic. I'm still a, a hometown boy here. There was one time that I enjoyed that excitement in New York and in different places, but, but um, I'm happy that this is the place that, that I call home. Awesome documentary right there on these two gentlemen. That really was uh, it very in-depth. I love the use of the archive photographs, uh, a couple outside interviews. It was really cool. It was really cool. It was a great job by Professor Keeley and all the Allegheny students who worked on it. You know, and let's get you guys' reaction, Daryl and Lynn. Uh, what did it mean to you to see this documentary being made, to go with your family, to watch it being presented? Then they had another showing after that, which was standing room only. Uh, and I read, Daryl, it kind of got had tears in your eyes. Yeah, it was very touching because it took me back in time, uh, some of the pictures, you know, back when we were little kids. And, uh, 
you know, the whole thing, you know, was basically about family, you know, how we grew up and how our sports career was surrounded around the family. And, and uh, so, yeah, it was touching. I think you saw part of the video with uh, our coach in, uh, in Lionsville, uh, John Acklin. It was kind of touching to him. And, and um, so I, you know, sometimes you don't really realize how, how it affects people, but uh, um, I guess it was, you know, you know, we come from a small town and you have two kids that come from a small town that happen to, to make it to the big leagues. I think that's something that they take a lot of pride in. Lynn, how do you feel about the whole thing? You really had tears in your eyes? <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, no, it was nice. It, it was a nice presentation. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. I thought the girls did a very good job. Uh, it was well organized um, and they put it together. The music <laughs> uh, was well done. Uh, the pictures, to to put the pictures and, and integrate them into the film was really nice. Uh, but it was about family and that was the big thing that uh, I took away from it, uh, that uh, we're local. Uh, it, it means a lot to be uh, in the area and to have grown up in the area and to show how uh, family was a big part of uh, who we are and what we did. You know, it's amazing uh, being an outsider from this area. I came here in 1975, coming from Long Island, and one of the first stories as, as you guys were developing at, th at that time was about you guys being tremendous high school athletes in this area. I know people, you know, the Jones brothers, and I'm like, who are the Jones brothers, you know? And then, uh, you know, Daryl Jones, Lynn Jones, and and, and and how it grew, how you guys are so humble about everything you've achieved, but how this community loves you guys. You know, I mean, they are so proud of you too. It is, it's, it's unbelievable how many people are proud of you too. Do you guys ever s sit back, and I think Darren and I, you t we talked about this last week, sit back and, and say to yourselves and pinch yourselves and say, man, we did something we did something that very few people can do. We played professional baseball. Yeah. Well, Mike, you know, I, I think we've talked about it. I said, you know, there was no reason to be boastful about anything. You know, it's not the way we were and uh, not the way we are. And uh, um, certainly proud of what we did. I'm proud of what my brother's done. Um, but along the road there you know you had to have breaks too you know it, it's it's in any type of situation you know things have to go right and you know Lynn will tell you in his story uh, where you know things weren't going exactly right for him and he got his break and sometimes you got to be at the right place at the right time you know you know I go back to our high school team you know and everybody always talks about the Jones boys you know but but Lynn will tell you that we had one tremendous high school team and we had a lot of good players didn't we <laughs> yes you we know did. Dave Oliver um, Timmy Myers Timmy Myers uh, there was Strisky and um, the Headleys and Undercos and they, they, they were just good baseball players and uh, so you know they didn't have the opportunity to do the things that we did but uh, you know sometimes that gets lost you know it's uh, that baseball team uh, out there in Linesville was uh, it, it was an incredible team I would have challenged I would have challenged anybody in the United States you know that we could have played against at that time because we were good but you know, it was an accumulation of a lot of a lot of good athletes out there. And not only with that, with just Linesville, uh, we had the opportunity to join forces a lot of times because our district was Linesville, Conneautville, and and uh, Conneaut Lake. So in the summertime was even better. Yeah, <laughs> we got to join forces with the teams that we competed against mm -hmm. uh, all school year long. Uh, whether it was basketball and baseball, but baseball in particular, we, we had the opportunity to join forces and we were pretty good uh, when we had the opportunity to do that. But, you know, it wasn't a matter of how good we were and how we thought that we were better than anybody else, uh, whether it was our team uh, or whether it was individuals, we were having fun and it was about the competition and that meant more to us i mean the winning part of it was was fun 
but to compete with your friends uh, that meant so much and that's kind of what I, I took into professional ball is every year you you had different people and different teammates uh, and we enjoy I enjoyed every year that I that I had in baseball just because of my team uh, teammates and the camaraderie that we had uh, for that year I thought it was uh, very interesting talking about going to college you know Daryl goes to Westminster has a great career Lynn I didn't realize basketball was your first sport. How was that? You know, I, I know you talked a lot about, you know, growing up and trying to impress Daryl, trying to stay on par with Daryl, but then you go to college and you play basketball. Uh, Tim, sort of like Dick Grove. Yeah, the two sports stand <laughs> Not yeah. quite that good. <laughs> uh, a little different, different level. Basketball actually was his first yeah. job, too, and he ended up yeah. playing baseball. So how, how was your basketball career, Tiro, and you know, what made you, you know, shift the focus back to baseball? Well, Daryl played basketball, too. I, in, in, in the same sense, I kept up with Daryl because, to me, he was a better ba uh, basketball player than I was, but his love was baseball. Then can he shoot the three? That's what people no. want to know. No. <laughs> we didn't but, have the three. <laughs> but but, but he, he drove to the basket better than anybody I knew, and uh, I was one who kind of laid off and, and would rather shoot the jump shot. But what happened with me is I, I was deciding wh where I wanted to go to school uh, and wasn't quite sure. And Bud Maines, the basketball coach from Till College, uh, who, you know, it's, a, it's, it's one of those things who you know uh, at particular times and getting the right breaks. Well, uh, Mrs. Fales, <clears throat> who was our junior guidance teacher, her best friend was uh, Bud Maines' wife. And so she told uh, him about me. He came up to see me and then I went down there uh, to play basketball. Uh, and baseball just happened to be going on down there and it wasn't what I was really going to do but you know what it was about playing sports all year round and that's what I did. I played sports all year round and, and ended up playing three sports down there. Uh, so uh, that was just something that we did. We weren't one. We weren't one sport athletes in particular. Uh, but that's kind of the the atmosphere that we grew up in. And you both were playing baseball, and then you're in the minors for how many years? Five. Five years, which is long bus rides. You know, Daryl <laughs> too, and taking long bus rides, going to different places. You're playing in the Tiger organization, is that right? No, I was in Cincinnati. Cincinnati, and then you get to Detroit, or what happened with me was I I had a very good uh, my fifth year. Uh, I was with Indianapolis AAA my first year there. Had a very good year, and they didn't put me on the roster. At the end of my fifth year, uh, I could become a free agent. Talking about the Reds didn't put you yes. on their roster. They didn't put me on a forty-man roster. So I was eligible to be picked up in the major league, what they call the major league draft, right. uh, during uh, the winter meetings. And so the Tigers picked me up, and uh, it was by coincidence that uh, Les Moss, who was a AAA manager with Evansville, I killed Evansville. <laughs> and so being in the right place at the right yeah. time. And he became the manager. Tigers, yeah. And so they drafted me. I go to spring training, and Les tells me from day one, he goes, You're going to be my fourth outfielder. Being in the right place, right time. Okay, now you go to the major leagues with Detroit, correct? You're in that old Detroit stadium, not the Camaro. Tiger Park, Stadium. <laughs> which has a lot of history. I mean, it's so many awesome players have played in that stadium that wore the Tiger uniform. Never, you know, never forget the people that came in from the other teams. But you know, you know, Greenberg, Kaline. I mean, you know, guys that Detroit fans just idolize. You walk out on that field, a you know, a kid from Lyonsville, Pennsylvania. <laughs> goosebumps. How'd you feel? Seriously, the first time. Uh, it's kind of overwhelming. Uh, the thing about Tiger Stadium was it was the old stadiums. They had the old. Uh, support beams so you had to the fans sometimes if they're yeah. in the wrong spot <laughs> they had to look around uh, mm -hmm. uh, these big beams uh, and it's, uh, when you looked up in the stands on a packed crowd there were never any seating there was nobody sitting behind there there was always a little <laughs> pocket of empty seats right behind the 
uh, the beams, but you know, you walk in this place and it's dark. It's a hitter's park. It was, they had just renovated the, the ballpark and they had deep dark blue seats and it was close. The upper, upper decks uh, was right on top of you. So it was a hitter's ballpark. And you know, you walk in, you walk in there and what was nice is I had been, I had the opportunity to be around during spring training and and during that that initial time to be around the guys from the 68 team. They wow. were always coming back nice. and forth. Uh, and what a you know, what a great opportunity to to kind of come in and these guys were always nice. Plus I was with a bunch of guys that were really good teammates, Alan Trammell, Jack Morris, Lou Whitaker, Lance Parrish, uh, Kurt Gibson, all these guys that were that later were famous, you know, for the uh, 84 team. Uh, I grew up with those guys uh, and spent five years with them. So they're some of my best friends uh, in baseball. So to, to go in at that point and be a part of it, plus the 68 team, uh, always coming back uh, was was really nice. Was was spectacular. And Darrell, we all know a lot of people know your story. You drafted. You're in the Yankee organization, which means that you're locked in there because the Yankees are going out and buying everybody in the business that they can get a hold of. You're having a great. Good thing they don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they don't do it as much. They have a lot of homegrown players right now on their team. But anyway, you're having great years in AAA. But again, it's hard to get there. Ever think about saying, you know, I had enough. I'm not going to get to the majors. It's frustrating being locked into this organization. It was frustrating, but I never, I never got to the point where I really wanted to just leave the game because I loved the game. I loved my teammates, like Lynn would say, the camaraderie that you had. I, I felt like I knew I once I got there, I, I belonged, you know, mm -hmm. and I had, had put my time in. And uh, so, yeah, there were, there were some times in the, uh, when I was in A for a third year that I remember calling back home, talking to my mom and says, you know, you know, I don't, I don't know if I, I'm going to go anymore. And what my mother say, she says, hang in there, you know, and you hang in there and guess what? Good things happen. You get to trip away, and then I had tremendous years in trip in trip away. There's the ESPN sign. Huh? Right on schedule for, <laughs> for the trip away call off. That's it. <laughs> so did I ever think about you know uh, leaving the game? No, I I enjoyed the game. You know, even seven and a half years in the in the um, uh, minor leagues with the Yankees. Yeah, I always. You always want to be in the big leagues. You always want to get that shot. You know, you feel you deserve that shot. But, you know, there was a lot of other guys in my situation also. And, uh, you know, again, when you look back at it, you know, we were fortunate to be playing a game that, uh, that you loved. And then, you know, you play for the Yankees, and you're in Yankee Stadium. Again, a, a, a young guy from Lionsville, Pennsylvania. And let's go back. There's no cell phones. You know, there's no <laughs> Internet back then. I don't think ESPN has started yet, okay? There's no all that attention. So you might have seen baseball, you guys on TV, the game of the week, which was maybe one game a week uh, on NBC or ABC, whoever carried it back then. So you're walking out on Yankee Stadium. You, you know, how's the roof built? That's the old Yankee Stadium. It's not the one now. You must have goosebumps, Daryl. Well, I was in Columbus with my father. My father was actually down uh, visiting me and spending a week with me down in Columbus with the Columbus Clippers. And and uh, after one of the games, uh, was that morning we're having breakfast. And by the way, that's your Triple A team back then. Yes, and um, in the International League. And the phone rang, and the general manager George Sisler says, uh, Daryl, he says, pack your bags. You're going to New York tonight. And I said, <laughs> all right, who is this? <laughs> You know, after all this time, sure. you know, I actually thought it was Larry Mer Murray, who <laughs> Lynn knows, who was yeah. a jokester. And I said, and I, he had to really convince me that I was getting on a plane and I was going to New York that night. And um, I think it really hit me when I finally got there. I think we went into LaGuardia. They had somebody pick me up at the airport. And I got to the stadium long before the players got there. You know, I think I was there like two in the afternoon and uh, 
Where's my locker right next to Thurman Munson? Munson, one of my heroes, okay? I mean, just a great person, that, you know, uh, a great individual. And, uh, and Billy Martin comes in and he says, Jonesy, he says, you're in a lineup tonight, <laughs> you know, wow. right there, you know. So, so, and I think you know the story that it was my uh, second at bat. Uh, Charlie Lau, hitting coach, had told me, he says that Jerry Kuzman is going to show you fastballs, and he said he's going to try to get you out with curveballs. And he had a fantastic curveball. Yes, career. he did. And he, hu he hung a curve that I was looking for, and I hit a double down the line. I got to second base, and I think in the documentary I said it was like I finally made it. You know, that something came up on the scoreboard that said this is Daryl Jones' first. Uh, you still have the baseball? Oh, yeah, I still have the baseball, as Lynn has his first uh -huh. against Doc, Doc Ellis. And, uh, you so, guys got your hits off two good pitchers. Yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah, no yeah. Bad, you know. He may have been tripping, though, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he might have been after Reggie hit the transformer yeah. in Detroit. <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, looking up at, at the stadium and to see that, you know, you thought, wow, seven and a half years, all the time, all the commitment, dedication that you put into the game, uh, it, was, it was worthwhile. Your first hits off Doc Ellis, let's go through that. Tell us about that. Where was uh, it at? Was it at Tiger Stadium on the road? No, it was in Arlington Stadium in Texas. We were playing at Texas Rangers. That'd be about and 98 degrees out there. Then. My, my first <laughs> official at bat was a walk. My second at bat was a base hit. Nice. Uh, so that was that was nice. Uh, I got that out of the way. My base percentage is really high, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> start, yeah. And uh, I... I my first home run was memorable. It was in uh, Milwaukee at County Stadium, and I hit Milwaukee very well. Who was the pitcher? Uh, Jerry Augustine. Remember him? Sure. And he was a lefty. Mm -hmm. I hit a home run to left field, and I didn't know it till after the game. I got the ball. Nice. John Lockenfuss, who our bullpen was in right field, he went over underneath the stands and traded five balls nice. huh. for, for the home my run home run ball. ball. Uh, and they were just bullpen balls. Sure, yeah. uh, but he signed, uh, he he traded those, and so I have that ball too. So it was kind of nice. Did you know it was gone right away? I mean, because, you know, Jim and I, like, we didn't play on that level. We only played Little League and so forth. Uh, no. And the thing is, back no then, back flip or nothing. when you hit a home <laughs> run, you ran. You 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 ran around the bases. There was no dog in it. There was none of the stuff that you see uh, today uh, because they'll knock you down. They'll uh, and it just happened to be that Milwaukee. I I always played well against them. Always hit well against them, and I used to always get thrown at huh. uh, by Milwaukee, and uh, which was fine. That was that was my. That was my respect. That was an honor for you because Absolutely. They, they wanted to get you off the plate. They feared you. Uh, Absolutely. Interesting. I know both of you guys have been around baseball a long time. There's a lot of you know bean balls and everything like that now going around. They're trying to soften the game. Everyone says, do you know when someone's doing it on purpose? Can you tell? Today? Yeah. I, Even no. when you played. Oh, yeah. You know when it was on. <laughs> oh, yeah. When, when, when I played, you knew exactly when because what happened with uh, the times that it would happen – is you knew, the other team knew, your team knew that somebody was going to police the game. It wasn't going to be mm -hmm. the umpires. It was going to be the other team was going to police the players. So uh, if you dogged it, if you took out a guy and uh, it was somewhat of an illegal slide or you clipped somebody and it, you didn't like it, you knew that somebody was going to get bean for it. And you know what? It was over. If you fought, it was it was a done deal after it was over, and I, I was in some really good fights. Really? Oh, there was some doggy dog fights, and <laughs> uh, people, in some cases, people were hurt. Uh, but you know what? It was done. The mm -hmm. next day it was done. There was no animosity towards that. Now, I will say that uh, Al Collins uh, had, he had this, his, his, Thing built up a long time when he was when I was with Detroit. Uh, Ed Farmer hit him in the jaw, and 
it was, I think it could have been a year before, but this build up with Al Collins, and that was when he was with Kansas City. And when he came over to, uh, to Detroit, he had a base hit or he, fly, he flew out. And when he rounded the base, he yeah, went rounded the base and went right at, uh, at oh. Ed Farmer. And it was a Downey Brook, you know. Yeah. It, was a, it was good. But we had fights like that that were great. And they were all out uh, fights. But when it was over, it was over. You know, the, we policed ourselves. Mm -hmm. When did you notice the shift kind of change when the umpire started taking over more? I know you, you played until 87 and coached into the last decade. When did the game really start to take the change where, you know, he can't do that anymore, he can't hit it, guys? Because it seems probably, like... Let me get I was going to say, because money... You guys are getting money. The money changed. Game. Money changed the game. Yeah. You had to protect the money, right. uh, mm -hmm. protect the players. Uh, so in the '90s, when the money started to get uh, very high, uh, you saw uh, the commissioner, uh, Major League Baseball, take a different stand uh, as far as that's concerned. They got the umpires involved, and I know this I, from talking with a lot of the the uh, umpires from my days, and I'm good friends with. Uh, a number of them, they don't. They don't like. They don't like having that responsibility uh, of monitoring the right. game. Yeah. Uh, it's it's too hard because they have they have that problem where you don't know what happened three weeks before. Right. Uh, you know that crew's not sure. They're not sure what's going on. So you know you get an inside pitch, and the next thing you know. Somebody's getting thrown out of the game or getting a warning, warning and now yeah. it's like, why? Yeah. Real quickly here as we start wrapping up, Daryl, Lynn career, a little longer than yours, then he went into coaching. You had an injury set back in your career after you got called up for the Yankees. You ever thought about going into coaching at that time like Lynn did or? You know, once I, I kind of got out in the, in the real world, world and I was working, I did have, uh, and I don't know if that contact was through Lynn, but um, uh, Jim Beatty was the general manager at the okay. time at, in, was it Seattle or Seattle? Baltimore? Seattle. And uh, uh, I had a brief contact with him, and he asked me if I wanted to uh, get back, you know, into the game. And, you know, I wasn't married at the time, and I was, I was still single. Um, but I was doing well at what I was doing, and I really didn't think I needed to get back into bus rides and all that <laughs> stuff again, you know. And I enjoyed what I did getting right. coming back and uh, coaching Legion baseball uh, in the Linesville area for 18 years, mm -hmm. and uh, had a lot of great kids, and and you know now I have an opportunity to uh, have a you know a bunch of great kids up at Allegheny College. So I think the path that I took, I'm, I'm very happy with it. You know, I tell you what, both of you, Lynn is now helping out at Teal College where he played. You're up at Allegheny, Daryl. The communities, both communities are better for both of your presence. And and knowing you, I know you a little bit more than I know Lynn, but knowing both of you, you guys are treasures to this area. <laughs> you guys are. And you don't even realize it, and you're so humble about it, which like people like me and Jim and a lot of people I talk to in this area are like, man, it, they're so nice, but they don't realize what they achieved, you know? And, you guys achieved something historic. And hopefully, uh, you know, Jean Shanley, I know, is pushing for maybe, uh, she sent a copy to Ofer Winfrey, and they're pushing to make a movie, you know, a big screen <laughs> thing about this, because it, it's, a, it's a really unique thing, Jim, in this area. You know, you think about two young men from a small town, both made it to the major leagues. One with the 27 world champion New York Yankees. <laughs> and, and, and the other one, Lynn, you know, you got World Series ring from Kansas City with, on the first Kansas City World Series team yeah. in the history of Kansas City, which yeah. is unbelievable right there. That's, that's history. So that's great. So, you know, I want to thank Daryl and Lynn uh, for stopping by and helping us uh, reminisce about their career and also the great movie that you saw. Thank you for watching Sports Close Up on Armstrong.